got the chapter nine, the flying cloud. The flying cloud. We are about to commence liftoff of going to Mars. Yeah, and who's waiting under the ship but our buddy John Jones? Oh well, I was gonna go before before that. Pardon me. Uh, before that, oh, we have <laughs> yeah. Before before we see John Jones, we see uh, Colonel Flag and Jordan, and we actually. Uh, have them have how apologized to flag, which I thought was yeah, it certainly sucked up to not sucked up, but like swallowed his pride and, and apologized to him. And yeah, flag's certainly a uh, uh, a rightful bad word. I'll say that he's certainly a, a a dumb head sometimes. But I love this line of now get your butt in down there. I've got a dozen ex Nazis in that mission room with their fingers on the switches. Keep an eye out on them for me. Yeah, that's pretty fucked up pretty fucked up to think and then we also have a quick uh little cameo by dr magnus and his team and just stupidly dr magnus was the leader of the metal men or at least the creator of the metal men excuse me it's all basically the prim not prim the primary metals in the periodic table and uh, basically robots that have unique abilities uh depending on the metal so th there's just that but yeah we get like commencing and we see faraday looking at the screens and you see John right there. I'm surprised he didn't use his invisibility. I don't know why he didn't, but whatever, he just chose not to. And we have their confrontation. Take it away. Yes, yeah, so they take off and the uh, Martian manager is going to jump on, but Faraday interrupts him and they have a little bit of a spat there. Yep. And then uh, takes off. Yeah, they take off, but unfortunately John didn't go with him because he couldn't leave King to die there. And so he saves his life. We have a good one-page spread of the rocket taking off, and yeah. I, I like the fact that they, they talk about NASA and how that was actually going to occur, and that was, they, they were going to get out to, or try to, be, you know, beat the Russians, uh, or the Soviets, excuse me, uh, or catch up to them, excuse me, but this was like, we're going beyond that, which is nice. I, I don't yeah. know why, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, we jump over then on 259 to Arkham Asylum. And it's not about any of the rogues gallery inmates, interesting enough. It's a hero in his own right, uh, Adam Strange, who is kind of like Star-Lord in that he... I don't know if he got... Yeah, I, don't, I don't think he was abducted, but he certainly can... He goes to and from space. It'll be interesting to see if there's a team-up book between him and Hal Jordan, since they're both the spacemen of DC. I will say that. But we also get a little introduction of Ray Palmer... Uh, aka the Atom later on, but he's not the Atom in this story, which is funny enough. We'll get back to that later. And also, of course, a Batman ally, a longtime ally, Dr. Leslie Tompkins. Uh, we don't know if they know each other here, but certainly, basically, he's a, Adam Strange here is a, a nutcase for, on one page as, as a setup for later, and that he is also been uh, infected his mind with the center stuff. But then we also talking about the center i like the fact that we begin that center and we see another person who has been influenced by the center and i didn't even realize this on 260 we see that uh what's that guy's name um yeah jesse bright yeah jesse bright one of the other suicide squad members uh also is under the influence of the circle or the circle the center uh and then i see another circle that's where it comes from and that he scraps the mission he he sabotages the mission that's like dot dang yeah that's pretty surprising now, uh, here, N Nels Air Force Base 30 hours later, I didn't realize that, 261, here's where the um, payoff is. So we see in the background on panel one, we see Vandal Savage, computer monitors, lead, read Vandal Savage, Leonard Snart, somebody behind him that I don't know who it says in number five, Rex Tyler, and then seven is unknown. And Russian Manhunter is in number seven, and actually at the bottom we can see, in, in panel three, we can see Vandal Savage clearly right there um, in number three. But we see Leonard Snart there. If you look at panel six, or if we look at um, monitor six, I don't see Tyler. Yeah, I just see a bed. Yep. That, yeah. I know that sounds like, oh, it could just be off camera. I'm pretty sure that would be showing the whole room. So like, I don't think it would be under the room. That guy's dead. Oh, well, that, fair enough. <laughs> I mean, anyway, I don't know if I can see anyone on the first snart uh, either. It just looks no, like he's in, he's in, no, he's in bed. He's actually sleeping mm. in the bed. 
Yeah, well, I guess, I guess that's fair. It doesn't quite look it to me, but I'm not wearing my glasses here. So. That's totally fair. Uh, but here we have basically um, the conclusion that Martian Manhunter has reached with Faraday. Uh, I'm not a murderer. It would have diminished me to let another creature die unnecessarily. But I also saw into your mind, and by extension, your heart. I could see that you are a man of conviction, and I know that you uh, are doing what you believe and doing the right thing. You are not evil. Within your mind, I can see that your struggle is in the name of good. You believe it is the struggle that will end. In your heart, you honestly believe there will be a better day when all this won't be necessary. To find that within you, King Faraday, it has filled my heart with hope. Yeah, no, that was that was something interesting. And even Darwin Cook said that, you know, King Faraday started off as like a nobody. He he started off as like, oh, yeah, he's just this character I'm going to kill off eventually. But then he found that when he was writing with Martian Manor, they actually paired off, uh, interestingly, they paired off very well together. And we found that, oh, he's actually, like, a, deep down above all the... All the crap that he has he's actually like uh, he wants to see the world in a better place it's just that he's willing to compromise and, and do things that aren't morally just sometimes to, to get that again the ends justify the means and there's a whole topic of debate on there but yeah it's just I found that interesting I definitely felt that their scenes were the ones that soared the most the king in, in him before yep. then, I just kind of thought King was just an asshole. So, but then we actually give him character, and I'm like, oh wow, this is actually like a character, and he's not just. It's an. It's almost an interesting take on like he's the Nick Fury almost. Not not really, but it's it's funny that he kind of see he's in that position of Nick Fury, but and it's the same like the ends justify the means. But we have a character that literally has the ability to look inside your heart and tell if you're lying or not. So we actually see like this man means to be good I, I just found that interesting oh, but after that bit there we cut back to the uh, the flying cloud with its uh, sabotage situation here yep and the challengers of the unknown race off to go and rescue him which King is very much not happy about yep because he's wanting to uh, call him the big guy aka I think Bishop Six which yeah that's a great little bit here if Aaron were here, yeah, there's some chess motifs in this part. <laughs> I mean, King, Bishop Six, uh, Hal wants to... Not Hal. Um, I think King Faraday actually says to John Jones, like, back at the precinct, that he is more of a chess man himself. Um, but yeah, then we all the way, all of a sudden, like, jump to Tokyo Bay of Superman fighting what is obviously Toy Man. It looks awesome. Just just a great little bit. Yep, all it needs is a giant monster to go come come across as well, and it'd probably be great. But yeah, I just love the fact that we have a serious situation here, and the fact that uh, oh yeah, no, what's happening in Tokyo Bay means nothing. It's like oh okay, fair enough. But <laughs> we find out what the problem with what's on the rocket, which is Flying Cloud had a secret protocol. There are three warheads in her cargo bay. One is viral. The second is nerve agent. The third is a hydrogen bomb. Weapons were meant as a final solution if the Martians were a serious threat. And I also have to question right there, if Martian Manhunter read his mind, why didn't he... Didn't he... Wouldn't he have known that? Yeah. I mean, maybe they didn't realize that plan yet. Maybe it wasn't until they encountered him there. No, I guess that's not true. That's not true. Yeah, I don't. I don't understand it then. So yeah. I gotta. I gotta say, like, um, wouldn't wouldn't John have something to say about that? Of like, you were gonna exterminate my race. Yeah, what the heck? Should have. Yeah. So yeah, I gotta call out that either. I want to sound like a dunce and say Darwin didn't think of that, but I'm like, oh, what's going on? But then we have basically this this action scene of the challengers of the unknown trying to basically stop the stop the um the Ferris Airways ship from, like, getting into the atmosphere and burning up and releasing all the uh, cargo and onto the into humanity, which would suck. And what happens, what happens, what happens? Yeah, Superman beats Toy Man. By the way, that is supposed to be Toy Man. Uh, or at least one of his uh, his robots, excuse me. Uh, beats one of Toy Man's ro beats robot. Yeah, beats the robot, excuse me. And then it's like, this better be good, Faraday. Love that. And the ship 
re-enters the atmosphere, and what we get next is what should have been, or uh, what could have been, excuse me, the life I never had of Rick Flagg basically, you know, his last moments and seeing, like, oh, what could have happened between me and Karen, and yeah, again, Karen is is uh, another character here. I kind of wish we got some of her thoughts. It's not my worst yeah. thing, but that certainly is a thing I wish we had. We didn't really need it. I mean, we, maybe no. we could have used more female characters, but she, there wasn't enough there, really. In terms of the function of the character. Oh yeah, we have we certainly have enough female characters anyway, but yeah, it would have been it's just this one feels sidelined. Yeah, I do love the art on that page though, the the two kind of uh, Oh yeah. Juxtaposition. It's, again, one thing that people probably called or compare Darwin Cook to is is Kirby. And there's actually some illustrations in the back of the book that reaffirm that where he actually draws is does his best Kirby impression. <laughs> um but this scene right here just reminds me of, of Kirby. I don't know why. It just looks something like Kirby would have done. Like the Fantastic Four re-entering the, uh, re 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 the Earth after their incident. And we get that beautiful like one-page spread of on 257, or 276 excuse me, of Superman uh, getting the Challenges of the Unknown out of there. It's it, uh, very toasty and whatnot, and very interesting, very interesting. Then the Arlington Cemetery, the Twenty One Gun Salute, and Faraday is sad. Wondering in on on two fifty or on two sorry two seventy uh, seven who that woman is in the background. I think that's one of the I think that's uh, June the uh, the challenges of the unknown uh, uh, agent I think. Yeah, but after that bit there we uh, get uh, it's Al the introduction finally <laughs> yeah the introduction of the Green Lantern's house sitting. Sitting in the simulator room, feeling pretty sad about how the mission all turned out, and then a green yep. light just kind of envelops the scene. We also get another display of uh, of of fifty sentiment of what they had with uh, we had it early on with John Cloud since he was in Avito, but we also get here of Tom, uh, Hal's regular sidekick back in the day. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, they call him a uh, well, I'm not gonna say it, but you see it right there. Well, they say it in the book. I'm still not gonna say it, but. Yeah, that, that word, which was a unfortunate, yeah, slur used in the day. I kind of wish, I know, he's, it, I know he calls him white bread, I wish he called him a cracker, because that would have been even funnier, but that's just me. And I like that Hal uh, gives Ace a call, and uh, tries to talk to him about what just happened, but can't quite get it out. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, certainly like, oh, how do I explain myself that I found this little battery? And then we see a little bit of the Abin's third stuff there. We also see that um, little setup of uh, of Lois and that too, but uh, Lois and Jimmy at the Challengers Mountain, because uh, that comes in a little later. Oh, that, that's. But yeah, then we out, see yeah, yeah Ob, Ob and Sir, um, we're at Chapter Ten, SOS Green Lantern, and yeah, it's. I love the fact that uh, two things that Ob and Sir was called here. We do this multiple times of like, why did the Green Lanterns come to the Earth? Like, what was we are, and we always redo this of like Ob and Sir coming to Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, it was because of the center, and also, why was his rocket destroyed? Because of what, or his ship destroyed? Because of the rocket that just blew up in the atmosphere, which I guess has no harsh effects on it, so afterwards, with all the cargo, I think they dumped the cargo. Yeah, they got the cargo out of there, that's right. The Challengers, you know, got the cargo out of there, and then they, the rocket blew up, that's what happens. And the rocket was what blew up uh, the ship because it was yellow energy, that's right. As I approached your atmosphere, a cataclysmic explosion flooded the with light and poisons from the yellow spectrum consumed me. That's that's literally what it is. Yeah, we get some more great like, art here. All this oh, stuff yes. the Green Lantern. Oh yes, just awesome. Yeah, I guess we'll cut past some of this because there's a lot of Green Lantern stuff here. <laughs> yeah, just more. We get we get more. I feel like the fact that he says suffering Susie. I don't know if you care for that or not, but I, I found that pretty cool. Yeah, I don't mind I that. I don't mind that either. Um, yeah, he learns a little bit about the the strength of this ring and what it can, what it's capable of. So, if I may ask, since we're with Hal right now, what did you think of how? What do you think of Hal Jordan before you read this? Not not too much, really. Post reading this, oh, I certainly like him in this book. It doesn't change. Yeah. Cause I've read some some books where he's just kind of just a little bland. Yep. Um, in that movie too, he's also pretty bland in that, but. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we, I think some of this, I don't know if some of this is in the movie at all. I wish we, this was the origin for Hal Jordan from then on because it just, it makes him much more a character, which is nice. 
mm -hmm. and and probably gives you a reason why because unfortunately nowadays a lot of people say oh yeah hal jordan was the greatest green lantern of all it's like was he though like the guy ended up killing his once the city was yeah. destroyed and i forget which comic that was he then goes mad with power steals all the green lantern rings becomes possessed by parallax and then like goes on a killing spree trying to recreate the uh coastal city it's like is that guy ever Damn. great this makes him great I don't know if it makes him the greatest, but it certainly makes him a good character, let's put it that way. Yeah, at least in this book. But you'll probably have to take more of the lead from this point on, because that's where I, unfortunately, wasn't able to finish it. Yes, and then we have, yeah, more, just more of him, like, moving mountains, literally. Like, Superman, almost, and limitations, and safety protocols, and all that stuff. And then we are now at Challenger Mountain, and we get some confirmation on what's going on with the DNA of each of the creatures, the dinosaurs from Dinosaur Island. And what is it? The DNA is loaded with the code exclusive them, it's types of the readers should be fast blah blah blah. Uh yeah, basically just like Techno Babble. Yes, Techno Babble, there you go. And then we get the fact that uh there's another warning going on, another little uh there's an alarm and um there's another magazine of, of Ray Palmer on it. You can see that in a second. <laughs> uh chapter eleven, towards the center. Getting close, boys, getting close. We have Clark Kent. I love the fact how we introduce Clark Kent, by the way. We don't even say it's in Metropolis. We just have, you know, this reporter guy here. Uh, was ham sandwich, by the way. I just realized that. And this typewriter. And right there is a letter that says Clark Kent, Daily Planet. I'm like, that's brilliant. That's, I, I like that. The, that form of uh, page layout, I like that. Yeah, and this is basically the Dr. Seuss book, right? This is a Dr. Seuss, Theodore uh, Smeasel. Mm. Um, and if you read this a little, not the more, but this basically states that I've grown restless in my youth and yearn to explore the other spheres that cycle endlessly around the glowing center of my world. I shall fee feed and yeah, I shall feed and I shall grow as always from the center. So basically, Theodore Smeasel is talking, is being talked through the center. And this is all the center's thoughts, basically. Yeah. Uh, and what seems a heartbeat, these things had proliferated, and both numbers and destructive means another heartbeat, and they had brought their conflicts to my haven. By the time they had harnessed the most destructive forces on our sphere, I concluded it was time to leave my azure home. That's not how you say it, but... Oh, so it does, does go back to the nuclear stuff. Yeah, it does go... I guess, yeah, it is that, but I didn't take it as that. He was always wanting to explore, or at least get off the island, so... But you're right, yeah, it was the it was the nuclear... Not manifold, what do you call it? It was the nuclear option. Yeah, that and that's smart of Cook to kind of weave in that Cold War aspect. It's such a huge part of that time, so... Yep. Makes sense. So that's the center's desire, is to get off the planet. I like the fact that it was... The center doesn't talk up doesn't talk at all in this i remember in the movie he's voiced by keith david but i like mm -hmm. the fact that it never speaks in this uh i think i prefer that choice i love keith david don't get me wrong guys is an amazing actor but like with yeah, this, this i like that he talks through other people and yeah, this was an important bit that i was uh missing from my i just didn't remember it from my last read yeah, he says he sent forth all those little guys around because he was looking for energies that he'd require in order to yep. the yep. spheres and brace. So. And that's where we'll get to. There's literally a line that I didn't realize at the end of the story that I was like, oh, okay, that's why he's there. We'll get to that. So that, again, their point that will we'll put a pin in that. That's what it So Clark, uh, knowing some of that stuff now, goes off to track down Batman, have a little chat with him about what they've learned. And who do we meet? And this is again. This is another. You know, I guess the whole book is my favorite part. But yeah, this is. I, I like this part as well. Of just like the lead up to, and and again using Superman's super hearing, and we hear, you know, a child's voice. And who do we see? But it's the boy Wonder himself. Yeah, and Batman's taking on a bit of a different look now. He's going less for the fearsome look. He trimmed down his little, uh, little ear points at the top, and now they're nice and thin, or nice and uh, small, I should say. Yep. Going for a little bit more of a family-friendly uh, appeal. <laughs> I set out to scare criminals, not children. As for the boy, well, I guess we're just two lost souls who know each other. Yeah, I really like that scene too. Yeah, he's not. He, this is like the only. This is the only point we see with uh, Dick Grayson. But 
it's still nice to see him there. And he really is a boy in this. He's not a teenager. He's, I think, legitimately a boy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's kind of nice just to see him there. And then uh, we get go back to Paradise Island, and they're you know one one D and another Amazon are training right now. And she says "holla" by the way, which is a thing that a lot of kids nowadays use uh, in their vernacular. So I'm wondering what that means. I guess it's a Amazonian Greek term. Yeah, but they're having their little fight, Wonder Woman and someone else, I'm not sure who. <laughs> but, and then something ominous uh, fills the scene. So I guess we'll get back to that in a bit. Pin in that. We have a chess match going on. You want to get much into this scene, or? Basically just, like, talking about how we're going to need everybody. Oh, yeah, first we see who, why, uh, why King is named King, excuse me plan of what's going on the menace and then we get it may take the combined efforts of all americans to meet this challenge it is your government are you ready to accept that it is your move king and then we go to cape canaveral in florida oh boy here we go so challenges of the unknown we saw them previously at the mountain and they all geared up with lois lane and uh, jimmy olsen they responded to this big massive event that was happening there this giant giant enormous again another pterodactyl flying like creature i know it's not a pterodactyl but just it looks like that we almost have them end up in the mouth but they get out of there and then it's like oh yeah we need we need bishop six and we all know who bishop six is and we also get a um is it captain no, no, no that's morgan oh yeah there he is so we get a brief introduction to captain nathaniel adam the eponymous Captain Atom. Yeah, a lot of atoms in here. <laughs> Whatnot. But yeah, Captain Atom. He's not Captain Atom in this either, but... So we basically see... There's a buzzing sound as well. In that. And then we see Superman, Bishop Six, come in and take out the creature. Oh, yeah, then we jump over quickly and we see Aquaman. I, I don't think we see him much more in this book. So we see him more in this than we do the movie, because I remember he only shows up literally at the end, but... But here, uh, it actually affirms that we. this is a whole, like, other book that could have been made. This is a, all the facts that this is a book that doesn't... It's almost like an event comic, but it doesn't have any tie-ins. And it almost could have used some tie-ins. Actually, yeah. that's probably what it could have done. Then we could have had, like, different... And it's all written by... Uh, probably been massive, but it could have all been written by uh, Cook as well, where we have par parts of the civil rights being talked about and then we have Aquaman here because I love this where it's like within and without one casts all about for fear of what lives at the center and it's basically like the boogeyman of Atlantean dwell uh, Atlantean mothers used to tell the kids uh, and also I love this that it's like at my back the largest army in the world ahead of us a threat so vast it could exterminate half my birthright again yeah we don't we don't see him a lot there should have been more with him but also, I love that he has a, um, I think it's a, a, a bi, bi den I think it's not, it's not a trident, it's a bi dent. Next page on, two, on, on 314 is the largest army in the world, and I love that. I don't know how, if they did that justice in the Aquaman movie, but man, I'd love to see that in, 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 the, in a film where he just like sends a whole wave of all the... Every, all the oceans everywhere and all the critters in the ocean and just like destroys the surface world that's another thing it, I don't know if you've read this before but it reminds me of uh, the part with Aquaman talking about how he's in control of like the largest army in the ocean or in the world excuse me reminds me of, I don't think you've read it yet but in Kingdom Come he mentions uh, that he he said that great line of like he uh, Superman controls or at least protects like 30 percent of the world and aquaman protects the rest of the seven the 70 percent yeah i just mm -hmm. i like that line a lot and i it almost made me feel like could kingdom come honestly be like a an end point for this universe like this particular story in a way like this is the beginning of the hmm. justice league and then like kingdom come is the last story of the justice league i think it honestly could work yeah that's fair but anyway, chapter 12, The War That Time Forgot, so... Yeah, Scamry, it's basically everybody coming together, and there's still this buzzing that's going on, and everything's... Everyone's trying to get... Yeah, everyone's kind of in a panic. We see uh, Wonder Woman 
everybody in the base at Cape Canaveral is trying to figure out, like, oh, what's going on? And they're scrambling. Yeah, panicked. And then we have, we hear another buzz, we hear this buzzing, and it's like, Superman's like, I know that sound. It's a prop plane. A P-51 Mustang. I have no idea my my planes like johnny knows more about planes than i do he knows a lot more about guns than i do as well i have nothing about planes i know a little more about automobiles because of my co-workers but i certainly was never interested in that kind of stuff but here we get this probably is completely goofy but again i think it works we get wonder woman in the invisible jet and she's bloodied she there is blood everywhere I mean, not everywhere but oh boy it was i remember darwin cook in the liner notes talking about how he wanted to somehow have the invisible jet in there he's like i don't know how i'm gonna do that and other thing is that she flies she can fly although i guess it's interpreted that she can't fly fast like she's not a fast flyer like she she's fast on me wrong but she can't break the sound barrier so she uses a plane i guess that works it's always the question of like if you can fly why do you need a plane or whatnot why do you need a vehicle to transport yourself in uh it's like the flash having a a flash mobile or something like that but yeah we see her crash i like the panel layout of how she crashes on the 370 or 317 excuse me and then in panel two we just see we actually see the outline of the plane itself uh what are your thoughts on mm -hmm. that no that's cool yeah I guess that's it and then basically <laughs> uh we basically uh get superman she gets he gets her out of there haven't flown this thing in years yes i'm a little rusty and gets her out there to a medic and then we have the news report of lois lane who convinced i guess was there's radio silence and or not radio silence but th there was no reporting going on or they couldn't record stuff and we see in really nice um I forget how he did it, but he in, in really nice, um, col no, not coloring, but filter. There we go. A good filter of what the um, CRT TVs were like in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks awesome, especially the shot of the center beast. Then we get the center on 322 and 23, and holy crap, 23 mile, 25 miles across. That's at least 40 ish kilometers yeah yeah 26 kilometers or 26 miles is is a marathon i believe yeah so that's about that sounds about right jeez that's 40 that's long that's like i'm trying to think now that's between here sorry i'm saying and probably uh it's furtish yeah about that area wow yeah it's crazy that yeah just oh it's beautiful this was this is a great two-page spread yeah, but Flash uh, sees the news on the TV, and he just, he, he can't stay in retirement anymore. He's got a, I like that Iris already knew that he was the Flash, and it has got his costume ready for him. I, I, I made a mistake. I thought, when I first read this, I thought she, I thought there was a line said, that she said, you left it out. Like, you just left it lying around. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> it's it's not. I read it what back. What book were you reading? I don't know. I was, <laughs> I, I had no idea. It was late, and I was... I'm not That's tired. Fair. Yeah, I, I guess I understand I, that. I'm glad I I'm glad I reread this because it's it's so on my <laughs> mind right now. But yeah, it's like I don't know. It's the whole like oh yeah, I'm an investigative reporter. Of course I'm gonna know. It's like yeah, secret identities mean nothing. But yeah, I love the fact that uh, I, even though it's very little, I do love their relationship. This is probably the closest thing to like a like traditional '50s looking romance. I I guess I enjoy it. Yeah, not that we see too much of it, but yeah. Yeah, then we flash back to Nell's Air Force Base, and King Faraday has, uh, things have gotten bad enough, he's coming to Martian Manhunter, like, okay, it's time to put our plan to action. <laughs> um, before, before we move on and go that, I love the little scene of, like, we see, uh, Vandal Savage, you know, blabbering about to Faraday. And he uses the R word on Savage, which I'm like, oh, you know, okay. Um... And again, this is where I'm a little like, um, Cook, what are you doing? Because we have the, uh... It's 2006. It is... Uh, for, uh, or 2004. It's 2004, but even then it's like, well, this hang on. Faraday threatens Savage of... Because he's immortal, he's gonna, like, gas him twice... Uh, was it twice an hour now from now on? Which is like, oh, golly, that's, that's terrible. And then all of a sudden, he radios in for a chopper to get ready. And then... 
he's like, oh yeah, and have them gas Savage twice an hour till we get back. <laughs> and then there's like, pardon my language, bastard, and the background, which is pr was pretty awesome. I'll say that and pretty funny. But I'm like, why didn't John say anything? He's like, dude, seriously, like why? Unless he read his mind. But it's like, I still would have like loved to have John's be like, yo, what the, f like why? That's that's where I'm just like, Cook, are you sure you thought this through properly? I don't know. I'm... He's got more on his mind. He's though. got more on his mind. That's fair. I'm <laughs> starting to look at the cracks here. It's like, um, I don't know about this. <laughs> just like, does he really mean it to the end? But anyway, yeah. Then we get a shot on two thirty or two twenty eight of, or sorry, three twenty eight of Green Arrow. Yeah, we the, see some montages. Yeah, the Green Arrow, the Sea Devils, and the Blackhawks. Yeah, and also how. Oh yeah, who's hiding out at some. Uh... I don't know if he's hiding out, but he's at some um, motel. Yeah, I didn't motel, think so. I, I didn't think he was hiding out either. I was that was a little weird. He could just be kind of staying to himself to kind of think, contemplate what's going on. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's probably what he's doing. Of just like uh, meditating and being introspective of what's going on. The fact that the other thing he says, spacemen exist. I'm like, Su Superman. Like, hello. <laughs> Superman exists. There are some cracks. But anyway, so he heads back to Ferris Air Base. And here comes Carol and... strutting in, just all angry of like, you know, low-down son of a gun. Uh, how the pacifist is going down there to get killed by that thing. I love how they're both kind of mad at each other, but still, like, wish that they could have maybe a better exchange here at the end. Well, they certainly get their exchange on uh, 233. Or, sorry, 333. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, at the kiss, yeah. And, yeah, that's... Uh, Aren't you at least going to say goodbye? That's a great <laughs> shot. I certainly enjoy that. I wouldn't have expected if... Uh, yeah, but to point to some holes, shouldn't their hair be on fire? <laughs> I think it's supposed to... Technically, you see that it's away from them because in the <laughs> previous shot, they're not directly behind the thruster and the yeah, exhaust. Yeah. So you literally see it on two, on 332. Like, they're behind it. So, <laughs> yeah, he's playing with... I think, yeah, he's playing with space and time here, but it's an angle. What do you expect? Yeah, but then we get to chapter 14, the Boy Scouts last. So, now everything's gone into fucking chaos territory. Big beasties are everywhere. Here's some gore. And we actually, uh, first off, this, this opening scene is not of uh, the present. It's actually the past of when they invaded yep. the Amazon Paradise Island. The Mascara, excuse me. And they demolished it. Jeez. <laughs> I like that little flashback is more in like a sepia kind of tone. Yeah, no, I love that it's uh, it's kind of the, the colors are all dulled. It's pretty nice. Yeah. yeah, and it's pretty crazy that she kisses uh, Superman here. They have their oh, little yeah. scene where she's kind of explaining what happened, and then and does she die? No, 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 no. It looks just, like she dies. It looks but... like she dies. When she <laughs> I don't remember. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, it's it's been a while, sir, but no, she does uh... not die. She, she, she lives. Yeah, it's only been like a month and a half, but it feels like it's been a lot longer with all this moving stuff. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> uh, bottom of uh, panel three on 337, we have uh, both these characters, or we have a bunch of characters bickering right now. Yeah, Sergeant Rock is in there, and Darwin Cook wanted to use him, but apparently he could not, which is sad. But we have, yeah, we have all these, um, we have each of the characters bickering, and it's like a Marvel movie, yeah. But I think it makes sense because it is America and all these people do have different ideas and ideals, excuse me. So, of course, they're all going to uh, disagree in this, in this sense because it is a time of political uh, divide, division. So, it's fine that happens. And then, of course, big thunderclap by Superman with the red eyes. And somehow it looks more menacing here than it does nowadays because every time we just... Because now we just can't stop doing Superman with red eyes, so... But here it's really awesome. Yeah, and he finally takes uh, Diana's advice, and instead of just following the administration, he takes the role as a leader. Yeah, pretty much. And even calls out, like, uh, what happened to this country of ours? I will no longer be a party to any form of oppression or persecution. So I hope that's him stepping his game up and being like, yeah, I'm taking on the clan eventually, hopefully. But that's for another time, of course. Right now we have more pressing matters of... It's not that we don't want the clan exterminated at this point, and I mean, I would like that, but it's going to exterminate everybody and the clan, so... Yeah, the whole planet. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I also like the fact that he calls Diana his best friend, by the way, which is interesting. And I guess that is the case, that him and Bruce probably aren't... They're, they're, they're still, no. like, big friends, but... 
Oh yeah, I guess definitely estranged. Yeah, but by the way, before we, I know I'm probably jumping the gun here, but I'm trying to. I gotta find that panel again. Uh, yeah, here we go. The, yeah, the, I completely forgot about this, but unless I've not seen it yet, but there was a panel of Bruce and I think uh, Superman talking about why he's not at the scene right now. I guess we glossed over that. Oops. Hey, we've we've covered more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> Three hours and six minutes. Yeah, but it, it, it and it's just a slight important uh, just because it explains where Batman is and that he was using his resources uh, to help get all the other military available over here. But yeah, anyway, then we have Faraday talking with Superman and introducing John to him. And I love the, likewise, sir, I greatly enjoy your animated adventures at the cinema. Uh, yeah, and then he's like, yeah, I'm going to go scout out what's going on and takes on a bunch of the uh, goons and cannon fodder. And all of a sudden, it is like using an atomic bomb to snuff out a candle. My mind explodes into Alizar and Flowers of Pain, which is, I like the fact that it's uh, Martian Manhunter uh, talking, or talking in the scene, uh, and he's like mind melded with Superman, that's kind of cool. And we see what happens, and basically they, we have the, you know, the strongest hero on the planet go up against the uh, this, you know, this massive being, and it just shoots him down like nothing. Yeah, it shows they need to work as a team yeah. in order to take this guy down. And obviously, I don't know if fans of Superman are like, that's stupid. Like, what the f***? Yeah. Uh, I, I found it okay. I was like, it's probably not the worst idea, but of, you know, putting... Because they did go with the whole, like, oh, why didn't Superman just destroy it at first? Well, he did. And it almost destroyed him, so... Anyway. Yeah, but I like that we cut away to the moon here oh, with the, the Phantom Stranger. Yes. Calling together some buddies here. <laughs> oh yes, this is another, and this is another like part where Cook even talked about this in the liner notes of people would be like, "This is just out of nowhere. We just had Superman go down, and the, the thing itself is about to destroy the Earth, or sort of." When I was talking about the more intricate art. I mean, this is the section of the book where things just start to really, like, so much more um, kind of splashy. Yep. Unique look. Stuff. Yep. But it's basically. Everyone's like, wait a minute, I thought magic characters existed in DC. And it's like, yes, they do. And here they all are. We have the Phantom Stranger, Zatanna, Billy Batson, a.k.a. Captain Marvel, the Spectre, and Dr. Fate himself. And it's like, oh yeah, couldn't they, you know, be, they, they said, what is it? We possess mystic forces that could perhaps defeat the center. I don't, I honestly don't think so. I legit think that the center, they would be resistant against magic. I feel... Something that size could probably resist magic, even, like, counter it, perhaps. But, yeah, they basically state that the reason they don't interfere is because it's humanity that has to... This new generation has to do so, and that eventually they hope that... It, it will be several millennia until mankind transcends science and finds the true nature of existence. But that is the order of things. Uh, cop out? I don't, I don't fully know, but... Yeah. Also, forgot to mention that the center came from space, you know, millennia ago. Ended up, you know, on Earth and created dinosaurs out of the other forms of the dinosaurs and lived peacefully. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. But anyway, chapter fifteen, which felt like it came out of nowhere when I, f I first read that, I was like, on chapter twelve, I noticed that, and then I was on fifteen. I was like, wait, what? That went fast. And we start off with Lois Lane, you know, giving an interview, and she can't do it because you know her her soup is gone. He's, he's, he's been dead. And I kind of like this, that we actually assume he's dead. I kind of enjoyed that. No, yeah, I like that too. Yep. Yeah, I liked her moment there. Yeah, so we cut over and then we see uh, Adam Strange leaving the asylum. And here's that, yeah, that's the bit you're talking about before, right? Yeah. Yeah, and we get um, Hal Jordan here. Does his ship crash? Maybe? Yeah, he, I think it would appear the saucer still had a few bugs in its fuel system or something. And then basically he uses the ring... As not a failsafe, but to power up all the secondary, the act as an energy source and power up, and kind of be a defensive tool, which is pretty cool. And then we also go to the Indiana suburbs, suburbs, excuse me, and finally get that payoff. Yeah, Adam Strange goes to pick up pick up Ray Palmer, bring him into the game. And I love the situation of because he's the one that will have shrinking technology, and it's like. But my device is flawed. It doesn't work properly. Exactly. I love that. That's. 
I always love that. It's like, when something doesn't work, use it as a weapon. It'll work. It's great. Yeah, so now everyone's prepped and ready to go and uh, get to chapter 16 here. And they kind of explain the Ray Palmer plan, as you were saying, how he tries to shrink stuff, but it's all unstable, and that's his whole plan to do this. And you can shrink that guy down and fuck him up big time. I like the little, uh, in panel 2 of uh, 356, we see... Uh, Adam come in with Ray Palmer uh, from the window and then landing in the toilet soldier seeing that and we also get a callback and our payoff to what happened in Central City with Faraday and the Flash we will see Green, La- Green Arrow there sorry talking about stuff uh, secrets and stuff and then we just see yeah Flash slug uh, Faraday for what happened and I thought that was a nice little payoff there and then <laughs> insult to injury we ask the, the two guys had arrived last like oh where can we find uh oh look it's the uh it's the illinois flash because apparently that's where apparently central city and keystone city are located in illinois or at least the illinois area it's midwest somewhere but where can we find the professor he's asked the jerk picking himself off the floor and that was here we go in chapter 16 the dawn patrol not the doom patrol the dawn patrol even though the leader of the doom patrol is the guy in the wheelchair if you notice that but yeah and Boy, this is a way better Independence Day than Independence Day, eh? Yeah, they're all heading off to uh, fight the battle. Yeah, after all, they're putting aside their differences there. Yep, and we see that Ace Morgan's like, Oh, hey, we are just uh, I was expecting somebody to show up, like they usually do in the movies, where it's like, all of a sudden you see the other main character from nowhere, and who appears but Wingman Jordan, he shows up. And then 2, 3, 64, and 65... We have the brave and the bold. Oh, but see, after all that, yeah, we uh, almost immediately Martian Manager is taken out of the fight because he gets kind of zapped. Oh, wait, is that happening right here? So what happens is the the monster that uh, Superman fought earlier, the big pterodactyl, actually blows up. Or sorry, r- what comes out of it is a lot of monsters. Kind of reminds me of Necromorphs almost, where there's a there's a certain Necromorph type in Dead Space where. If you kill it, a bunch of... Or if you don't kill it properly, a bunch of smaller beings come out of its body. And that happens here, and it's pretty cool. And, yeah, the fight basically begins. We see the aeroplane. That's awesome. We see the blackbirds. That's pretty cool. We see the sea devils rescuing people there. Uh, Where is there? Oh, we also get a... Look at all those crazy fish down there. It's like they're containing the turbulence from this thing. So that's what Aquaman's doing. He's basically having his army do a counter turbulence i think to i I assume it's causing a hurricane perhaps somehow and so he's causing his fish to like counter turbulent i don't know it probably doesn't matter but it's there for that reason and so it's basically not causing the whole air system to be chaotic and then we see jimmy olsen trying to get a piece of film back oh we also see the yeah ace morgan nathaniel adam and uh hal jordan all go into the center themselves and after that, we see... Here we go. Hey, look. Wonder Woman's back. She didn't die. Oh, yeah, there we go. And she's yeah. wielding a steel girder and using it like a staff. And it's like, oh, baby, yes. And then we see... this. Yeah, that's there's, here's a scene I was talking yes, about. Yes, here's yeah. the scene. Go ahead. Yeah, poor Martian Manager gets taken over by the center and attacks King. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of that episode, uh, Knight's Tale, or whatever, the one with Morgana and... Uh, Mordred R. Remember when, when Martian Manor kind of gets his mind invaded by uh, Morgana, if you remember that. Yeah, Night of Shadows. Night of Shadows, thank you. And then he... And he kills King. But he, not obviously intentionally, of course, but under control of the center. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but still, I mean, he feels responsible for it, clearly. Yeah, he certainly does. And I thought here was where King had superpowers? Like, I feel... Uh... I thought he did, but he, he doesn't. Yeah. But then we see him... he's just a regular dude. But then we have the Superman movie moment of him screaming into the air, going up and violently slaughtering all these... um, All these beings, all these creatures. Also, there in the background is Adam Strange. It's great. It's wonderful. I love that. So the blood coming down on him. Yeah, but now we get to the three of those guys in the center. And uh, this is when things just spiral off into real crazy town. Yep. And this this feels like kind of 60s Doctor Strange in, in some ways for me. Oh, yeah. Where all of a sudden we just have distorted images. 
Yeah, I don't want to just go through and describe all these images here, but I don't some think you can. Really spectacular stuff. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> I love the fact that he mentions he he thinks about when he's going through the mindscape or whatever you want to call it, the tunnel. Uh, he's thinking about yellow, and then all of a sudden this giant yellow crystalline snake thing almost comes at him, and it's like, oh, that's awesome. Yep. Yeah, that's awesome. Thinking about his weakness. But yeah, so everyone else's ships are getting pretty fucked up. Yep. And so he just blasts right out of his ship and. Hal Jordan, I should say, blast right out of his ship. And then... The, in his Green Lantern form. The ring reveals that the whole, like, you know, mind... F the 2001 A Space Odyssey ending is all just an illusion. It's because they're near the center's brain, air quotes. I don't know if that is a brain or not. And I love the fact that these ships are covered in, like, what looked goo and or gore, almost. Like, it's this flesh-looking mm -hmm. thing. It's great. That's something out of an OVA, I'd say. It's, it's great. I love it. And we actually get Captain Adams. We get his origin story here because Captain Atom, uh, the character, the Charlton Comics character, was his origin was that he died in an, uh, was an Air Force accident or a, yeah a, a plane accident, and that's in here. So he and then he reappears years later, and so we okay. get that huh. and. Uh, yeah, I wish we kind of had that later on, that he showed up at the end somehow. Not the very end, but I mean, I mean the very end of that book, but of the book. Anyway, sorry. Keep going on. We have them getting out of there, and they detonated the nukes that had to disrupt the, excuse me, the center. And then after that, Flash just bolts it to the center. And I love how he gets up there. It says, I use the water to my mm -hmm. advantage, kicking up a wall of ocean in front of me to ramp. I almost feel like that was Aquaman. Like, he created the ramp, and I'm like, that's awesome. Yeah. That's really good. And then he just starts running along this, like, floor of organic matter. It's, even though it's grass, but it's the same thing. But, like, just all this floor of multiple beings. It's great. And starts spreading yeah. around this energy beam that is what you, the atom uses as shrinking method and starts shrinking the island the, the island the center down and we then get Hal and uh morgan talking about how you know Hal is now the green lantern and it's like i gotta go contain the explosion because it's making its way over to uh the, the shoreline by the way forgot to mention here there is a line that was dropped that it came to the cape canaveral because it needed the fuel to rocket itself out of Earth's atmosphere. That's what it needed the fuel for. Nice. So that's where it was. And then finally, we get the buttheads. Yeah, the old creeps. The old green creeps. They're not creeps here. I'll say that. They're certainly not yeah. creeps here. Look more like guardians here. They are the actual garden guardians of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and they do their little uh, explaining about what the what it means to be a Green Lantern and what what he's supposed to be doing. You know, I'm surprised. I was expecting... I think he may have, like, mentioned it offhand, but I was expecting the oath. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll get that a bit later. Or he'd get that a bit later, I should say. We didn't... No, it's not... It, it's... it's. I don't think it's in no, there. No, I don't think so either. But uh, then he just throws uh, the son of a gun into the stars because, like, the son of a gun wanted to see the stars, so I send him on his way and just, like, tosses him like a boss into the stars. And that 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 actually made me immediately think of the ending of uh, Disney's Hercules, where he has, like, all the titans inside that one titan and then just throws them off <laughs> Earth and it just they just explode. And, yeah, I couldn't help but think of that. And I like that Hal just leaves after that. Yeah, he leaves... Um, yeah, he doesn't even show up again, surprisingly enough. Uh, on the yep. in the, and it's not even in the picture that's taking place. But then we see uh, this giant submarine, submersible-looking thing end up on. Or not even submersible; it's a tank because it has treads on that stuff. Those tanks yep. or tracks, excuse me. And oh, out appears King Arthur of Atlantis himself. And I didn't even think of that. I was like, oh golly, that makes. Why did I never think of that? That he's actually King of Atlantis, and his first name's Arthur. I'm a dummy. Uh, but we get, yeah, Aquaman rescued Superman, which obviously makes sense because he landed up in the sea and he be, seems to be one of the, everybody accepts him, which is pretty cool. Again, maybe because he just looks like a Caucasian. Finally, the epilogue. Yeah, but they're in the glow of victory that's, at this point, Yeah, that's so. true. And Lois embraces Superman there. 
Yep. Friend. Heroes. Exclusive coverage of America's Finest Hour by Lois Lane. Photographed by Jimmy Olsen. And finally, <laughs> we come to the new frontier. It is at long last yeah, the here. Epilogue. Yeah, real long. <laughs> so, when I first read this, I, I told you this already, but uh, off camera, of course, or off recording, excuse me. But I was listening to, the first time I read this through, I was listening to the Baby uh, baby Driver soundtrack, which has a lot of 60s uh, songs in it. And that really was, it felt appropriate. I really was in, like, just a 60s mood, because even though this is the 50s, but... Even still, I, I just had that mood in me, and I was very happy. I was even listening to the Dirty uh, Dancing soundtrack, which has a lot of uh, 50s and 60s tunes in it as well. But at the very end, I have a I have a CD uh, called The Best of Woodstock 69. And the very end, the last track, is Jimi Hendrix doing his rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, the only version of Star Spangled Banner I actually like, other than certain rock, like when Metallica did it at, I think, a Sharks game. But that's probably one of the greatest, you know, and versions of that anthem ever. And, yeah, I just listened to all of it throughout this, you know, this, this speech, and it was, it was like... I don't even know how to describe it. It was therapeutic and just a sight to be seen. It was great. It certainly put me in a mood. Paired up with a brilliant uh, speech here and some brilliant images next to it as well. See America kind of coming together more like that Wonder Woman's reading to a more ethnically diverse group of kids there in the future. Yep. Uh, John Wilson kind of gets some honor there. We see a young black kid reading a comic, hopefully about him. But <laughs> That's Steel. And, yeah, Steel is literally just, like, shown here twice. Uh, the first time, you know, behind the gravestone of John Wilson. And it's, I'm kind of sad that we didn't have uh, his his wife and daughter, uh, their gravestones around there as well. I wish that was there, but that's okay. Oh, do we see him again besides that one image there? Of Yeah, it's uh, I, th- I, th- I assume that's him in the on 401 at the white-only panel. Oh, okay. I mean, it could just be another, yeah. like, random kid. I have no idea, but I'm just... Yeah. I think that's supposed to be him. And then we have that one-page panel of Superman and John Jones, and I thought that was a C that they were looking at. That's Kansas. I'm like, oh, we're back in Smallville. Okay. Yeah, see a corn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but this is... This is great. It's using a famous JFK speech. Yeah. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that speech, if I may ask? I thought it was a perfect end for this, this book, and kind of, uh what JFK viewed as what was his future of the country was going to be kind of his reshaping of it before it was kind of cut short but and b- personally what is your not just on this book but the speech itself what is that are you do you do you agree with that do you think there's some problematic things there or do you think it's still a future to strive for no oh, yes yeah, it's a future to strive for yeah I mean, it's definitely we're not definitely not living in a perfect future now. No, we're not, especially in America. No, we're not <laughs> around the world. But I would say, you know, since this is looking at the lens of America in this book, it's definitely not reached the goals that that speech would have put forward. Yeah, yeah, this is a great final image, by the way, to the last page here. Well, it's not the last. It's all them. The last thing, though. It's not the very last because then we continue. We're in the Mediterranean Sea. I'm surprised we're there. Oh yeah. And what do we see? Starro has returned. It, yeah. it emerges with all five of the Justice League fighting him in a callback to the first Justice League of America cover. Oh, really? Yep. That's pretty cool. Yep. And that's the book. Yeah, but, yeah, finally at the end here, it's almost three and a half hours. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it'll probably be at least maybe t- three hours because there's a lot that will be trimmed out of there. I guess uh, the final thoughts, uh, if we can make them brief. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, no, we all have to work tomorrow. Uh, hmm, Final thoughts. I'm glad this book exists, of course. I want more people to read this book and realize that these are good characters and they're not milquetoast. They're not... That DC actually does mean something. And I do wish, as a kid... 
or yeah, as a kid, I could have got my hands on those comics, especially if you look at the cover uh, art, like the the, the the covers of each single trade or of each in issue. Excuse me, it's wonderful uh, in the back there. But this is something I'd love to do. Of just it's it's mass welding of of characters and stories together. But it's almost like could this be written as a book, like in, in like a, in a book form instead of taking individual characters and like oh they're going off on their own adventures and we see them have like a series to themselves what if we did more like this is an event series almost of an event comic but I don't know it just feels like a smarter one almost yeah no that, that's fair it's definitely probably the best event comic that I've read if you can really call it an event comic but I mean I don't really think it did lead up in that same kind of structure uh, unless you want to count Infinity Gauntlet I think this is better written than Infinity Gauntlet. Really? Infinity Gauntlet's extremely fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't call anything in Infinity Gauntlet except for Thanos kind of a deep exploration of anything. That's fair. It's just a, a just an awesome uh, space adventure. Yeah, that's true. I mean, as, as Cap and Eric once called it, it could be told in a Greek epic format. Yep. Whereas this is not, not just um, a look at these characters, but what these characters kind of represent in terms of... Uh, their place in history at that time so yeah I, I, I yeah i'm really happy with this book definitely uh very smart very beautifully drawn which you know is one of the big appeals for comics for me a sometimes even a great book can be ruined by bad art i think and i don't think there's a single ounce of bad art in this book like there's not and this is yep. just something that i think every artist and a writer dreams of when they can i think artists really is when they can write and draw a story of this magnitude. Other than like Mobius, uh, and, and maybe certain uh, Japanese artists and comic artists and or writers, I don't know if I've ever seen something of this magnitude before. I guess Akira, what am I talking about? And Nausicaa. Those are both Japanese comics. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but like just naming ones that I know of, those two of how like epic this this is. Mm -hmm. And it's all done by a single person. I mean, other than maybe the team as well of like the of the li the lighting and of the, the coloring and the panel layouts or uh, the lettering. That's what I want to say. Yeah, but uh, definitely anyone who hasn't read this. I mean, I guess we just spoiled the whole book for you if you even made it this far. But thank you if you made it this far. Um... <laughs> it's uh, yeah, you can blame me for this one. Yeah, work in progress. Or maybe our future comic reviews won't be in this, in this format. I, don't I know. just I didn't know how I was going to talk about it. I just need to write general topics of what to talk about instead of just the whole thing. But certainly a good inaugural episode. I'll say that. And please go buy this book, even if it is like it's one of I think it's one of the best mainstream comics ever. It's definitely a top ten from what I've read. I mean, excellent. Not in terms of like a run, but it's oh yeah. One concise story brilliant yeah i guess as a, well as a graphic novel yeah one of the best graphic novels ever made but yeah as like in mainstream dc marvel comic books and not creator own work yeah it's 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 really good it's 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 fantastic yeah and just before we shut this down was it like a 12 issue kind of release or was it like do you know i believe it was i i i, I fully don't know but i think it was something like that oh, okay yeah, I mean, again, such concise, great storytelling. It was just awesome. Yeah, again, this is what every creator would love to do uh, if they're working in the comic book industry. But with that, thank you for putting up with me. <laughs> I hope you got... Also, I learned that the uh, the was the Buccaneers won against uh, the Chiefs, so... Okay. <laughs> I, I was kind of hoping yeah. for the Bucks to win anyway, but... I definitely look forward to more comic reviews in the future. I'm really hoping we can get some more in there, but yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll do some different experiments, see what we can do to get it to find a good balance. And maybe it'd be better for shorter books too. Oh, you know, kind yeah, of, certainly. Kind of about panel by panel, but page by page at least. It's not going to be panel by panel, don't worry. But <laughs> thank you, ladies, gentlemen, and those in between for listening to this episode of the Novice Elitist uh, Comic Talks. I don't know what we're calling this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, exactly. If you and your family are 
in a Stepford Wives situation, and it's controlled by the center. You're actually on the center. All right. And you find that there are heroes, or not heroes, there are invaders, terrorists, who are attacking your city. And all the heroes are legal. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but they're, these are terrorists that are attacking your town, and get to the bottom of the fact that you're a part of the center. But you wonder if the center is actually good, and you're part of that. I don't know. I have no idea. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a nihilistic ending. Yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. I have no idea where I was going with that.